Hi folks, much going on in the world, but I thought this morning I would speak a little bit about two things that are very much in the news. One is Afghanistan and the other is Russia and Biden's policy pronouncements about both and what this all means or could mean, etc. So first Afghanistan, I bet you some of you find it disorienting that some of the people on TV and also in the paper, like David Ignatius, for those of you who read him, uh, who you normally agree with, uh, are all saying this is a big mistake. And then other people you normally disagree with, for example, some of the Trump um, co congressional people are saying, Biden is doing exactly the right thing. So the response to Biden's announcement that we're gonna get out of there by September uh, has sort of not the usual bedfellows on various policy issues. So the question I suppose I should answer first is where do I stand? And I actually think that Biden is doing the right thing. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but whether one thinks it's the right thing or the wrong thing, the important thing, of course, is to discuss what the consequences will be of getting out of Afghanistan at this point. Um, as everybody has said, we've been there for 20 years. Lots of Afghanistanis have gotten killed. A reasonable number uh, of Americans have gotten killed. Uh, most recently, we've had about 2,500 American soldiers there, adding uh, to those the um, NATO forces. Uh, you had about 10,000. NATO is also going to leave. And uh, for those people who are totally opposed to the idea, the, the notion is that all the Americans in the NATO forces will be leaving. Well, first of all, that's not entirely true because we have tons of CIA people there. We also have special forces people there. And not to mention hundreds, probably thousands of contractors. And there's nothing written anywhere up to this point that all of these people will be leaving. So in point of fact, there are going to be quite a few Americans, far more than are leaving, still behind in one capacity or another. Now, is this relevant? Not particularly in the sense that uh, bad things will happen in Afghanistan uh, in the near future. Now, you will recall that the Trump uh, had negotiations going on in the Gulf states between the Taliban and a and, uh, American negotiator uh, of, I might say, Afghanistani origin. Uh, and one of the criticisms of those negotiations was that, among other things, the sitting government of Afghanistan was actually not part of the negotiations. So to begin with, whatever they would have all agreed to, uh, the cons consultation with the standing government of Afghanistan was fairly minimal. But let me just quickly move ahead and say, whether we leave this year or two years from now or three years from now, Afghanistan will be a mess and lots of people will get killed. It, uh, worth recalling that the reason we went into Afghanistan was after 9-11. And eventually, of course, we uh, tried to root out and more or less successfully Al-Qaeda and Obama, uh, bin Laden. Uh, please recall that uh, bin Laden was killed not on Afghanistani soil, but on Pakistani soil. And here is one of the important things to consider. The mess in Afghanistan has been participated in by Pakistan, which variously has given terrorists like ISIS and uh, bin Laden uh, a place of operation. To this day, it is giving Taliban a base of operation. And the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is very porous in terms of the conflict in Afghanistan. Um, 
Pakistan has been playing a rather duplicitous game, sometimes cooperating with the United States and helping with the conflict in Afghanistan, and at other times undermining anything the United States and its allies were trying to do by supporting the opposition. Uh, why is Pakistan so interested in Afghanistan? Well, if you look at a map, it's next door to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is sandwiched in between, among other things, Pakistan on one side and Iran in another. And in the early days of American involvement, Iran was actually quite useful in helping the US uh, in its Afghanistan uh, endeavors. Uh, so that Iran is not coordinating things with Pakistan, although at various times it has coordinated things with the Russians. The whole history of Afghanistan is one of failure on the part of the British colonials and, favor, and uh, failure on the part of Russians to create some kind of order and produce some kind of stable governance in Afghanistan. None of them have achieved it, neither has the US and its military endeavors. And there is absolutely no reason to believe that if we stay there for another two or three years, anything more useful will happen. The Afghanistani government, Mr. Ghani, is weak. The Afghanistan military, which we are presumably trained, the government military, to look out for Afghanistan and manage things in Afghanistan, military experts think is very weak, which also means, of course, when we pull out, they will not be able to probably hold the line and protect Kabul, the capital, and so forth. So no matter how you look at it, Afghanistan is a monumental mess. And the question for those who oppose us leaving, which is most of the US military and quite a few politicians and saying, you know, this is irresponsible, we shouldn't be leaving. I think the argument needs to be made if we stay for two or three more years, the same irresponsible and disastrous and harmful things will happen. It is an uncontrollable mess by the, on the part of anybody from the outside. Now, is it totally uncontrollable? One of the concerns is for the women of Afghanistan, because you may recall that uh, the Taliban opposed the education of women, professional lives of women, and so forth. And one of the few successes of American occupation and NATO occupation and activities in Afghanistan is to bring uh, um, Afghanistani women into the forefront, getting them educated. There are quite a few Afghanistani women leaders now of, uh, in, the, in the government. And uh, the fear is that the, when the Taliban come in, all of this will end. Well, the uh, Taliban have begun to assassinate women leaders in Afghanistan for the last few years, judges, educators, and so forth. So it is certainly correct to say that educated Afghanistani women and women in Afghanistan who do not want to be sheltered in a very conservative Muslim setting that the Taliban advocate have a lot to fear. But they would also have a lot to fear two years from now. So the idea that we can somehow straighten things out by having 2,500 American soldiers there for another few years is an illusion. And it's an illusion the US has had for some years. That is to say, any day now, things will get better. We have added troops, we have withdrawn troops, we have at various points put the Taliban on their heel, that is to say, uh, the NATO soldiers killed a lot of the Taliban. For example, in 2016-17, uh, the Taliban in some parts of Afghanistan were in trouble. A lot of them were getting killed. And the feeling was that maybe they would negotiate and become reasonable. But then we started pulling out the troops again to lower numbers. And in recent years, uh, the uh, Taliban have flourished. If you look at a map that is often provided in the newspaper, you will see that much of Afghanistan is now run by the Taliban. And we are not about to oust those uh, folks either by ourselves or with the fairly weak and undisciplined um, Afghanistani government army. So 
what's going to change? Well, all right, so let's assume the US is moving out. It's, as I said at the beginning, there are lots of security people still there. They might be able to protect individuals and Kabul for a little while. And then it is said, okay, what Biden has done will lead to civil war in Afghanistan. That is probably correct because the Taliban represent uh, a ethnic group, the Pashtuns of Afghanistan. And there are other ethnic groups in Afghanistan, some of which have very strong warlords and other leaders. And once the NATO, including the US has moved out, those guys will also start fighting the Taliban for control of their region and uh, try to prevent takeover by the Taliban. So the idea that there will be a civil conflict in Afghanistan is not far-fledged. The question keeps re-emerging and I keep repeating myself, would in two years time or three years time the situation be any different? And the answer is probably, probably not. So what's the lesser of the evils? The lesser of the evils may very well be for the US to get out and to try to influence insofar as it can, uh, the outcome uh, internationally in terms of human rights, in terms of the UN, in terms of uh, security measures of one kind or another. Uh, how successful the outside world will be to control things once the Taliban take over is not clear. Now, I just said once the Taliban take over, the sitting government of Kabul imagines that they can negotiate with the Taliban as kind of a joint control of Afghanistan. Um, experts differ whether that would come off or that wouldn't come off. Uh, the government in Kabul is very weak. It is rife with corruption of one kind or another. Uh, it, it looks to me at least unlikely that that government and uh, the Taliban, even if they agree, make certain agreements that these agreements will last very long. I don't somehow, uh, don't somehow imagine that. Uh, so then the question also comes, where will Pakistan stand in all of this? And no matter what the American relationship to Pakistan may look like during the Biden administration, it seems reasonable to support that, uh, to presume that they will continue to support the Taliban. Now, one of the interests of Pakistan, which is very two-faced about all of this, is of course, they wanna make sure that India doesn't get a foothold into Afghanistan because as you know, India and Pakistan, to put it mildly, are, are in conflict and in competition. And India is very large, very populous, a growing economy and, and so on. And you can, uh, Pakistan wants to make very sure that India does not get a foothold in Afghanistan. And of course, India would like to get a foothold in Afghanistan. So Pakistan has national interests which go beyond sort of ideology and friendship with the Taliban. Uh, Pakistan has an interest in terms of its role in the region and its own national, national interests. Uh, what does one imagine uh, the US could do to soften the consequences of what's about to happen? I think there's a very important issue we should all think about, and that is an ethical and moral issue. Hundreds of thousands of Afghanistanis have worked with the US uh, in its endeavors in Afghanistan. Not dissimilar actually from what happened in Iraq where lots of uh, translators, for example, signed up. Uh, there are lots of Afghanistani translators that have worked with the military, uh, have supported the military, have had joint ventures with the military and so on. And typically what the US says to these people, work for us, we, you know, we'll pay you and treat you decently, but also if your life is in danger, we will get you out of there and you will, will come, you will be able to come to the United States. There are still hundreds, if not thousands of Iraqis who were promised visas to the United States who are still sitting in Iraq.
and the and some of them have been killed by the in in the current uh, regime of Iraq, but many of them sitting there. And you might have even read recently some dramatic stories of families that were split up, where the husband managed to get his visa to come to the United States, and the wife and children are still in Iraq, and vice versa. And there is great fear on the part of many Afghanistanis who in a sense have given their best to the Americans while they were in Afghanistan, who will want to get out of there. And given current immigration policy, not just during the Trump administration, but before and the current administration, which it's unclear how many refugees they will allow in, how, to what extent are we gonna make good and our promise and commitments to some of the Afghanistanis that we won't let them sit there and just be done in, get shot and killed uh, once the US leaves and their work with the US ends. So I think for all of us who care about, you know, human rights and the moral and ethical issue here, I think the moral and ethical issue is not simply the very conservative religious nature of the Taliban and their anti-women uh, religious positions, but also what about all these people who have worked in the US, including, I might say, some Afghanistanis who used to live in Fremont, who were urged to go back to Afghanistan and help the US there. What is going to happen with those people if we don't allow fairly large numbers of them to immigrate to the United States? I think that that's a serious issue and an issue that has not gotten enough attention in the sort of the turmoil of the discussion about, you know, what to do uh, and how, whether it's irresponsible or not irresponsible for us to leave. I would divide the responsible, uh, irresponsible issue into two parts. One, um, in terms of what commitments we made to the Afghanistan government, what we made to the very many NGOs, the commitments we made to women to rise and get educated and participate in government. That's one set of commitments. The other set of commitments has to do with all those people who gave their best to the US to make it possible for the US military in the US uh, activities in uh, Afghanistan to be viable and operational, uh, what do we owe those people? So I think we need to watch in the weeks and months and years to come and really need to push our legislators and for that matter, our president to say, yeah, it's one thing to leave. It's been a bad scene. It's been a failed US policy, just like the US policy in Vietnam was failed. And in Iraq, it looks much like failure. But it's one thing to admit your failure and what you sought to achieve. It's another thing to uh, not honor uh, either commitments or obligations of a moral and ethical kind for people whose talents and help you needed and wanted. And you can't just shuffle them aside and saying, you know, now you can throw your life into the garbage can because we are leaving. I think it's an, uh, it's, it, even under the best analysis that have been on the media and in newspapers, that has not adequately been, been discussed. So at the end of the day, I think we're probably doing the right thing, not because it's what we're doing by leaving is leaving uh, Afghanistan in a good shape, but what we're doing is what the British did and the Russians had to do to throw up your hands and saying, we have failed. We have to admit we have failed. We now need to do the best we can to help in Afghanistan insofar as that's going to be possible. Um, try to help the sitting government if that's possible. Uh, try to talk sense into the Taliban. Uh, Afghanistan will need international assistance of one kind or another, premising that on reasonable treatment in the human rights sphere of women and, and former quote unquote enemies and so forth. So we can still have some influence, it seems to me, but our capacity for influence uh, is going to be challenged by our willingness to not say we paid the price for 20 years, now we're out of there, but rather to say we've paid the price, but now 
since we have largely failed, we need to pay some further price uh, to not be irresponsible um, in, uh, in the face of what's gonna happen in the weeks and uh, months to come. So Afghanistan bears watching, it's going to be a mess. Uh, uh, political uh, actors will continue to quarrel. Uh, the military will continue to be unhappy because they always think, you know, with a few more soldiers and a few more years, uh, things will get better. They haven't gotten better. They're not going to get better. And it is a good thing that our military is under civilian uh, control and that civilians can make decisions even if much of the military uh, is enthusiastic about continuing uh, to and hopeful that it's, it can uh, pursue the, the aims and be successful. Okay, uh, we need to get back to Afghanistan in the weeks and months to come, but let me now turn to Russia, which is another big policy deal. You have no, all, no doubt all read that uh, the Biden administration has said to Russia its interference in the 2016 elections by getting uh, Klimnik, uh, a Russian spy, giving, working with Manafort, getting information so that they can run interference and support uh, Trump. Their interference uh, in the 2020 election was of a different order. It was mainly uh, to get uh, bad uh, press and bad news out about Biden, accusing him and his son of corruption. They didn't actually interfere in terms of the electoral process, the voting machines, or anything of that sort, but they certainly did interfere on the propaganda for, uh, front against Biden in the hopes of making sure that Trump, who they thought was a good partner, uh, would get reelected. And third, the accusation against solar wind and the hacking into so many aspects of the US government, the cyber uh, attack, uh, and so uh, Biden, in some senses, accused the Russians of these three things and said there's going to be payback and the payback will be uh, we will put uh, some, send some diplomats back to Russia. That's a typical diplomatic move. Um, so 10 Russians from the embassy are being sent back to Russia. And then Russia reciprocates and says 10 Americans from the American embassy uh, go have to be sent back to the US, in other words, tit for tat. Uh, on a more slightly more serious note, uh, the Biden administration also tried to throw some mon monkey wrenches into uh, the ability of Russia to borrow money and for people to invest uh, in Russia. It sounds fairly serious. It will be inconvenient for an economy Russian economy, which is not doing well in any event. Uh, on the other hand, it is not catastrophic. Uh, that is say, it, uh, this whole exchange of accusing the Russians and putting some sanctions on them is not negligible, but it's also not super serious. It is in some senses sending signals. And of course, Biden then added to it and said he wanted to negotiate with uh, Putin over, over other issues. Uh, what about American-Russian relationships? The th third or fourth category has to do with the huge amassing of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border. If Russia were really going to move those troops into Ukraine, you would have both Europe and NATO and the United States having to respond and you would have a open conflict. Uh, do, do people think uh, this is going to happen? Some do and some don't. I actually think that uh, Russia is amassing these troops less in order to invade Ukraine and more to show its military might. So Russia is weakened in many ways. It's gotten bad press, it's gotten criticized. It has a Novotny issue. He may die any day in a Russian prison that will raise huge international as well as national issues in Russia. Um, 
But basically, uh, Russia is quite weak. I keep mentioning that the economy of Russia is roughly speaking that of Spain or for that matter, the state of Texas, closer to home. Uh, it has a huge military. It thinks of itself as a major power and it wants the world to treat it as a major power. And Putin wants to make very sure that nobody in Europe or the United States fails to understand that the Russian military is very powerful, is very present and can be very threatening. Um, the, indeed, the Russian military is very powerful, can be very threatening, is nuclear and all the rest of it. Uh, so then the question arises, uh, you know, what will anybody do about it? Well, as long as they're just sitting there X miles from the border and are having military exercises, uh, President Biden is quite right to chastise them and to say, don't you dare move into Ukraine. And the West, uh, including Europe, needs to make very clear that moving into Ukraine in any serious fashion uh, is not going to be ignored. Of course, neither Europe nor the United States would like to have a shooting war uh, out there in the Ukraine. And it is a potential danger. I mean, somebody can make an error. Some, uh, if uh, Putin feels, you know, pressed against the wall on other issues, he may decide to put a foot into Ukraine in the military fashion. So um, the, the, the potential for the Russian amassing troops uh, not that far from the Ukrainian border is very serious, but uh, one can only hope that what Putin really is doing is wanting to show his military might and to make absolutely sure everybody understands that he is a power to be reckoned with. Uh, I think Biden has probably been fairly intelligent by uh, confronting Russia with a kind of on the one hand, on the other. On the one hand, we condemn you for what you've done domestically in the US. We've taken note. Uh, this is no longer a secret. Uh, you've been exposed. Don't you dare do this again, number one. And number two, uh, we have taken note of what you're doing along the Ukraine and with your military. And, you know, uh, don't you move them any closer or much closer to the Ukrainian border. In both cases, Biden has made it very clear that uh, none of these things are acceptable. And at the same time has made it very clear to Russia, let's meet, there are many issues we need to work on together. Um, military issues, even issues in the future of Afghanistan. Uh, the Middle East, Syria, other things, we have things in common. And indeed, we have some common interests. We're not always standing on opposite sides. And I think overall, it's useful to say that it's easy to have friendly and congenial relationship with one's friends uh, and to, you know, say, well, the United States and Great Britain, we've been allies forever. But it's also necessary for a major power like the United States to have relationships with people that it disagrees with and to try to find ways to minimize the potential for violence and maximize the areas in which one can overlap and agree. That's true of Russia. That's true of Iran right now. That's true in other parts of the Middle East. That's even true in Cuba, where, uh, as you might have noticed, the Castros are finally out of power and a new generation has taken over. But in due course, uh, when the Biden administration should probably go back to the days of the Obama administration and saying, yes, well, we don't believe in your form of government and we criticize you on human rights, but there's every reason to believe that one can have reasonable relationships in other areas. In other words, foreign policy is not sort of puritanical. You only deal with people you really 100% or mainly agree with, but rather to work out if you're a major power like the US, viable ways of transacting business in areas where you can, even with countries that you object to and whose 
objective and national interests are different than yours. So I, on balance, would argue that so far, at least, Biden administration has taken the right measures with, the, with respect to Russia, uh, and both, you know, on the one hand, being critical and taking note, and on the other hand, saying, okay, we're major powers, we have joint national interests, let's discuss those. I think that, as I said in the first half of our discussion today, that uh, the, uh, the Afghanistan situation is of a different order. No matter when we leave, it is a disaster. It has been a disastrous policy on the part of the US. Um, and it is, an, or ought to be an object lesson. You don't wade into countries that are complex, whose societies you don't understand, imagining that you can fix them with the military or in any other way. Uh, the Russians learned that the hard way in Afghanistan. I think we need to recognize that we have had to learn the hard lesson the same way and extending things, hoping that next year, the year after things will somehow get sorted out or better or that the US military, which has been promising almost every year that they are now in control of X or things are going well in Y region of the country, uh, simply was deluding itself by and large. The Taliban are largely in charge of the country and they con will continue to be. There may be civil conflicts and the Taliban will, if they want to operationalize their country once they are either in control or largely in control, will also need allies and support and want to be actors and we will have to engage with them, trying to influence them, but influence them in such a way that we compute our national interest and see what their national interests are and to see whether they even the smallest area of overlap of protecting, let's say women or schools or uh, getting the Taliban to see that their religious beliefs of 20 years ago need to be modernized to some extent, that other uh, seriously Islamic countries have also modernized to some extent with respect to women or at least are in the process of doing so. So we will have to be dealing with Afghanistan for many years to come, but I think this should be seen as a first step and both Russia and its actions in the world in Afghanistan will, I'm afraid, uh, occupy the Biden administration and those of us watching it all for many years to come. Thank you very much for listening today. See you again in two weeks.